the new environmental movement in the Nordic countries was Gandhian. It was a nonviolent movement. It was committed to civil disobedience. It was committed to the force of truth. It was inspired by Gandhi, mainly through the Norwegian influences. In Norway in the 50s and 60s, there had been an eco-philosophical reception of Gandhi, both in theory and in practice. The big names known to the world are Arne Ness, Sigmund Kvale, Johan Galtung, but a lot of acti activists was there. And it's quite important, I think, for understanding the presence of Ahimsa and Satyagraha in the Western world, that this influence that came to Koyarvi, that action site, uh, small action site with a few hundred people in South Finland in 1979, that influence came through oral tradition more than through written tradition. The theoretical background was quite strong, but what we learned there together was uh, about Gandhi, about Ahimsa, about nonviolence as a practice. And later on, we would read more about it. But then, 79, we had a movement uh, which we thought would had a message, voluntary simplicity. It was called in the US, I think, alternative lifestyle, we call it. We had a vision of a change of the way of life, which would be beneficial to all of us. We would have less consumption, a more truth, more moral fulfillment. That was the vision. We thought it was so obvious that what the new movements offered was a vision of a better life, more simple, uh, less material, but politically, democratically, spiritually, much more fulfilling. And then the shock, so that was 79 to 83. And the shock was the way the world responded. We thought everybody would come to us, you know, our <laughs> everybody joined just overnight like obvious. that. Yeah, yeah, the obvious thing was there. It was invented, we thought now. So the answers are there, so why doesn't everybody come? <laughs> and then it didn't happen, not everybody came. And that, that then became the moment, the need for philosophy for me. There was something there in, in Swaraj, which my friend, colleague, now sadly deceased, Suresh Sharma in Delhi, uh, Suresh called, uh, said one of Gandhi's and Hind Swaraj's um, uh, privileges, or one, one source, one reason for its importance is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't accept the normative standards of modernity as the you know, ultimate universal standards. That offers a larger vision of a normativity of, uh, and of possible normative standards than we can find in, in the critical theory uh, of Europe at the time. So that was in that, in that range of search and attention, how to overcome the limits of the best critical theory we had in Europe at the time in that, framework, Hinz Varaj had a place, and also Wittgenstein, as we can, Ludwig Wittgenstein, my early philosophical love, also came back to me in the same time, the search to overcome what I saw as some bottlenecks in the, in the development of the critical theory of modernity that was needed from my perspective in order to understand why the movement for Ahimsa, for nonviolence, for solidarity, could not achieve as quickly and as much as I thought in 1979 would be natural, inevitable, and very happy for all of us. But in the case of Gandhi, in the case of Wittgenstein, the experience is that to understand what I can believe in, what I can commit myself to as truth, I have to converse with the other. And in order for that to be possible, the other has to be free and respected as a free being, equal to me. So this is the connection with the search for what is true, uh, with freedom and nonviolence, because only in a conversation with nonviolent can the reminders, the uh, the uh, imagination, the experience, the wisdom of the other become real to me and become part of my growth towards truth. So this is what Wittgenstein discovered: the dialogic nature of truth and its intrinsic connection to nonviolence and democracy. And that was there also in Gandhi. So this is what they share. We can be wrong. Mm -hmm. That's also, I think, very important in Gandhi, that nonviolence is necessary. Uh, respect for the other must always involve respect for those 
whose analysis and whose ideals seem so radically different from us that we find them difficult to comprehend. So maybe everything I've said is completely wrong. So the other, only by facing the other nonviolently can I hope to learn more and see my limits and my mistakes better. People are complex beings. Yes. So the, the idealist side, the search for truth, the search for nonviolent community is always one aspiration people have. And when space can be created for those aspirations to, to flourish, then things can be better. So I think there is hope, even though we can somehow, we, can, we must face it that today many things are, are difficult, yeah. but hope is there and people can grow and we can grow together. So that's what we can hope for and what we work for together. Mm-hmm.